Welcome back to another private tour at the Western Museum of Flight. I'm Cindy Maka, the director. Today we have Colonel Wayne Scott, United States Air Force retired, who will tell us about JPAL's Joint Precision Approach Landing System, one of the most important capabilities that all American forces need to share in common is a terminal guidance system for approach and landing of aircraft. This is true whether the landing site is a prepared runway, an aircraft carrier, or a hastily devised forward base. JPALS answers this need. Hello, my name is uh, Wayne Scott. I'm a retired colonel from the United States Air Force. Uh, I will start off by saying I was not a pilot. Uh, I am wearing this flight jacket in honor of my father. He was a naval aviator, flew jet fighters off of aircraft carriers in the early 1950s. Uh, in fact, he was at sea on a carrier when I was born. Uh, but he instilled in me just a love for aviation and all things flying. And so uh, I decided to go into the Air Force. I went through ROTC on a pilot scholarship. But by the time I was commissioned as second lieutenant, the, uh, the Air Force was in the post-Vietnam drawdown. They had a surplus of pilots. And so I did not get to go to pilot training. But the Air Force made me a communications and computer systems officer. And as a result, I learned a lot about the various systems that are used to support flying and flying and op operations in all the services. Um, when I retired from the Air Force, I went to work in the defense industry, uh, leading the development programs for several systems to support the military. But the one I want to talk to you about today, uh, you already heard mentioned, is the Joint Precision Approach and Landing System, or JPALS. This was a United States Navy program. Um, the Navy requires a lot of precision landing aids, uh, especially for air operations at sea. Um, flying an aircraft is inherently risky in any situation, but when you're trying to land an aircraft where your touchdown point is moving while you're approaching, as in the carrier deck, not just moving, but um, uh, pitching, rolling, heaving, having a lot of motion, then getting uh, accurate direction to that touchdown point is very, very important. The Navy had a has a series of landing air traffic, uh, air traffic control landing systems that they use today uh, to support that. The first one is called the TACAN, or Tactical Air Navigation. That sends out a very, very high-powered signal. Uh, uh, so an aircraft up to 200 nautical miles away can receive a signal so it knows the range and bearing to where the ship is located. Uh, the problem with the current TACAN is that signal can also be used by an adversary to locate the carrier and its strike group, and therefore it introduces a threat. Once the aircraft is closer to the aircraft carrier, there is a system called the SPIN-43. It's a search radar, much like you find at many uh, commercial airports. Um, there's also a system called the SPIN-46. That's a precision approach radar. It's an older system. You've probably maybe seen that in films or whatever where a pilot or an air traffic controller is actually talking to the pilot and telling him if he's above or below his glide slope, left or right of his approach path, so he can make adjustments giving, given verbal cues. Uh, the next system that they use is something called the SPIN-41. That's much like an instrument landing system that you see at a lot of commercial airports. The, uh, that's a system that gives both an azimuth for the heading to the touchdown point and also a glide slope, the proper descent angle, to land at that touchdown point. Uh, and then finally, the one that's the most commonly used is a, a, a Fresnel lens optical landing system, IFALS. Uh, if you've heard, if seen any kind of Navy films, uh, you'll hear a pilot, they'll tell the pilot to call the ball. What calling the ball means he can see the lights and he can now use those lights to guide him down to that touchdown point. Um, all of these systems work well, but they're not extremely pre precise. Uh, they all rely on either radio signals or visual signals. And uh, in some cases, that's insufficient. Uh, I saw a video recently of, uh, it was actually a cockpit video through the heads-up display on an FA-18, where the pilot was approaching an aircraft carrier in the Persian Gulf during a dust storm. He, very, very poor visibility. Uh, ordinarily, they, what they like to do is get a pilot about a half a mile behind the ship at about a 200 feet above the deck, where he can visually see those lights, call the ball, and then land visually from that point. Well, because of the extremely poor visibility, this pilot couldn't see the lights. He not only couldn't see the lights, he couldn't even see the aircraft carrier. And so rather than being able to take over visually at half a mile, 
uh, he did not even see the carrier until he was six seconds from touchdown. That's how poor the visibility was. And then he had to put in some very, very rapid controls to get it to the right point, because in fact he was high and right of where he needed to be. So that's why a system like JPALS becomes very, very important. Instead of being radio-based or visual-based, it's actually GPS-based. It's very, very precise. It can guide a, a, an aircraft to that touchdown point, even in rough seas or very, very bad weather. Um, it basically works in three modes. Uh, the first mode, uh, it actually works out to 200 nautical miles. Uh, the ship uses its GPS sensors to uh, determine its exact position and it sends that to the aircraft via an encrypted data link out to 200 nautical miles. So when the aircraft tunes into the JPAL system, he can immediately know exactly what direction the ship is in and how far it is. But because that data link is encrypted, that information is not available to an adversary and cannot be used to, uh, uh, to uh, assault the carrier strike group. And that continues to update. So if the carrier group turns, uh, if it changes speed, then that instrument in the, uh, in, the, uh, in the pilot, in the aircraft, can still show the exact range and bearing of that aircraft as he continues to broach. Once he gets within 60 nautical miles and enters the carrier's air traffic control area, it goes into what's called surveillance mode. And at that point, the ship is still reporting its position, so range and bearing is still known. But now the aircraft starts to report, also via an encrypted data link, its identification, aircraft type, its airspeed, its heading, its altitude, its latitude, longitude, location, so that now the air traffic controllers can see that on their radar scope. It's not being painted by the radar. The radar be is not being used to see it, but it, pl it plots on the radar scope the exact same way using the data link, encrypted data link information that's being sent back to the ship. That continues until the aircraft gets within 10 nautical miles, in which case it moves into precision surveillance mode. Now is it not only getting more frequent updates of the location of that touchdown point on the ship's deck, but it is, uh, be, it is able to not only know its own position and speed and ele uh, elevation, but it's also getting any deviations or drift from the prescribed flight path that's going to take it right to that touchdown point on the deck. So as, it, as the aircraft gets closer, there's more and more information. It's up, updated more and more frequently, and the, uh, uh, the pilot can use that system to guide it to a very, very accurate touchdown point. How accurate? Um, the system was tested and demonstrated the ability for a landing accuracy of 20 centimeters. Now, that is about the width of a sheet of notebook, uh, just letter-sized paper. So you can see extremely accurate. Um, the system has been designed to be 99.98% uh, um, reliable, meaning 98, there's a 99.98% probability that the information being transmitted to the aircraft about the exact location of that touchdown point is, is accurate and valid. Uh, also, the system on the ship and the aircraft is fully redundant which means it's got about a 99.9% .9 availability rate. The likelihood that the system would go offline during a critical phase of flight, during a, an approach to the aircraft carrier, is very, very low. Uh, technically, at this point, the system is still in development and final test. However, because it has proven so valuable and so successful, uh, the Marine Corps actually deployed with the system, one of the developmental systems, uh, on board the USS WASP, LHD-1, um, uh, back in 2017. Uh, they took it uh, on a deployment to the Western Pacific and used it around Japan and in the Indian Ocean. They were very, very happy with its uh, capability. Uh, and in fact, uh, the WASP was in the Indian Ocean and was tasked for a strike mission in Afghanistan. And the, uh, the F-35 fighters that, made, that went on that strike mission used J-PALs for their return to the ship and their landing. So technically, J-PALs, while still in development, has already been used in combat operations. In May of 2019, uh, the Navy awarded a production contract for J-PALs for 22 systems. It is going to be installed on all of the Navy's 
aircraft carriers and all of their amphibious assault ships that are designated LHs, total of 22 systems altogether. The contract was awarded in May of 2019. The first system was installed on the USS Carl Vinson in April of 2020, uh, 11 months after the contract was awarded. Contract called for the first system to be delivered in 12 months. They actually beat that schedule by one month. While that system is in final test and is already in production, Raytheon actually developed a, a prototype of something they called EJPALs or Expeditionary JPALs. What they did is they took the JPAL system, they removed some of the redundant components and got the, got the footprint of it down to just a series of four transit cases and some GPS sensors mounted on tripods and uh, demonstrated the ability to deploy that to uh, an open location, have it set up and operating within two hours, and then guide aircraft to touchdown points within 20 nautical 20 nautical miles of where that system was set up. They could actually designate up to 50 different touchdown points from that one system. And so that was demonstrated in January of 2019. I actually was able to lead that demonstration uh, effort and uh, was very, very well received. Uh, that EJPAL system is going to be used at a joint military exercise in Alaska in May of 2021. Because the system has proved so highly successful and reliable, uh, the, uh, the other services, the Air Force and the Army, are considering entering the JPALS program. There's looking, they're looking at uh, putting the JPALS capability on some additional aircraft. At, at this point in time, it's only on the Navy's F-35B and F-35C, and it is planned for the uh, MQ-25 Stingray, the Navy's planned unmanned uh, aerial tanker. So the, the mission of JPALS is to be part of supporting the Navy's efforts to bring aircraft safely back, look, get them safely back to the aircraft carrier, even when there are high seas, very, very poor visibility in the event that it may be a pilot is disabled or the aircraft is damaged, but we can still bring that aircraft safely back to the aircraft carrier and assure both the aircraft and the pilot are available to fly another day. Thank you.